Humanitarian aid has been turned into a spectacle to justify a military intervention. February 23rd will be the day for the humanitarian aid to enter Venezuela. The press is waiting for self-declared interim president Juan Guaido. He's spearheading efforts to bring humanitarian aid into Venezuela from Colombia in defiance of the incumbent leader Nicolas Maduro. Venezuelan journalist Cesar Batiz is here to cover this battle of wills. The co-founder of online news site El Pitazo, he's exposed corruption involving government and military leaders. In doing so, he's put himself at risk. Men from Venezuela's Secret Service mingle with the journalists. They observe and photograph anyone and everyone, because it's from here that Juan Guaido plans to set off with opposition MPs on his aid mission. Cesar relays their every move to his staff at El Pitazo. Right now, we can see one of the buses carrying lawmakers in the convoy heading to the Colombian border. A 12-hour drive lies ahead of Cesar and Guaido's convoy, from the Venezuelan capital, Caracas, to the Colombian border. This road was once lined by huge fields of sugarcane, but the late president, Hugo Chavez, expropriated millions of acres of farms and ranches. Because of government mismanagement, the fields are no longer cultivated. The country even has to import sugar. This here is typical. Farms have been abandoned. All of the money that was invested here is lost. We have neither the sugar cane that used to be cultivated here and gave us sugar, nor do we have the vegetables that were supposed to be grown here to feed the Venezuelan people. The result is a hunger crisis. More than three million Venezuelans have fled the country. After Syria, it's the world's biggest refugee crisis. Neither Cesar Batiz nor Juan Guaido's convoy are making headway. The road is closed. We've been stuck in this traffic jam for over an hour, and the information we have is that the government so either the military or the police have parked a truck sideways across the other end of the Cabrera Tunnel to block the convoy from passing through. To bypass the roadblock, Cesar and his driver turn around. The bus carrying the lawmakers is stuck in the tunnel. We've had word that Guaido is in the black Jeep Cherokee ahead of us. Now we're looking for an alternative route to reach the Andes and the Colombian border. But no matter what route Cesar and his driver take, the military is a step ahead. It's blocked all side roads. In Cojeda State, there's a roadblock every 300 meters. We've never seen anything like it. But Guaido will still make it, and the humanitarian aid will get into Venezuela. A police or military roadblock can remain in place for hours. Cesar has lost track of the convoy. They say a beer truck's flipped over, but that's a lie. They've blocked the road. People's nerves are starting to fray. They just want to go home. A confrontation erupts with the National Guard. We complained because we wanted to continue our journey. We've been here for a long while and are tired after work. I was attacked by two female and two male soldiers. My husband and my brother tried to defend me and were both arrested. 
Who did they arrest? My husband, my brother, and my seven-year-old son. They haven't caught me yet, because I asked people here for help. But that's the situation in Venezuela. People just accept it, because we're all afraid, because they attack us. They humiliate us, and we just put up with it. After 12 hours on the road, Cesar hasn't even made it halfway to the Venezuelan border city of San Antonio. He's starting to doubt whether he'll reach his destination in time. There's hope. You can sense the hope and the determination among all of Guaido's supporters. They believe that they'll reach the border and that they'll get the humanitarian aid. But they're confronted by repressive forces trying to prevent that. But if the government resorts to violence to stop the aid from coming into the country, and Nicolas Maduro knows this, then the international community could launch investigations going all the way to the International Criminal Court. The burning question is, how will the Venezuelan military react? Until now, the generals have stood firmly behind Nicolas Maduro. The armed forces are a Pandora's box that hasn't yet been opened. They're water coconuts. In the state of Tachira, which borders Colombia, long lines form at gas stations. It's a paradox. Venezuela possesses the world's largest proven oil reserves, and yet its refineries are dilapidated, run by the military with no expertise. Venezuela has to import fuel, yet here you can buy 800 liters of gas for the price of a bottle of mineral water, because the state subsidizes gas. Look at these queues. They're typical for this state. Since gas is so cheap here, it's no wonder there's a brisk trade in smuggling gas to Colombia. That's why there are such long lines at the gas stations. Venezuela's military and Colombia's ELN guerrillas control the lucrative contraband fuel trade. After 36 hours, three times longer than planned, Cesar reaches the Simon Bolivar Bridge on the border. Thousands cross it each day to buy things no longer available in Venezuela or to escape the country altogether. One million Venezuelans have fled to neighboring Colombia. Others travel on from here to Chile, Peru, or Ecuador. How much to the casino hotel? 12 pesos. 12? That much? Cesar discovers that the lobby of this hotel is a good place to conduct research. Lots of Maduro's political opponents are in town. Like Luisa Ortega Diaz, Venezuela's former prosecutor general. In 2017, she called Nicolas Maduro's policies unconstitutional. To escape arrest, she fled to Colombia with a suitcase full of incriminating documents. She hopes they'll be used to bring charges of human rights violations against President Maduro at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. You know the beast from within, Madurism, Chavism, the apparatus of power. You know it well and that in the past, the government had lots of resources to overcome crises. Why are you convinced Maduro won't survive this one? I'm convinced because, for the first time, all of Venezuela's democratic powers are united. 
This is no fight of the traditional opposition. There is an opposition within Chavism itself, people who once believed in this project but don't anymore. Volunteers are waiting at the Colombian side of the border. Most are Venezuelans. They want to bring the aid, which has been supplied by the US, the EU, and other countries, into Venezuela by human chain if necessary. Listen, eat breakfast quickly and then come to the Tienditas Bridge. We'll be waiting for you there. So eat and go there. I embrace you because today's the day we must do all we can to free Venezuela. It's not just about getting the aid through. We must free our country. Mientras estamos aquí buscando toneladas de ayuda, algunos pretenden bloquear el paso generando violencia. Bienvenidos al lado correcto de la historia. Bienvenidos a esos militares que hoy se ponen del lado de la Constitución. Cuando son las 10 y 33 de la mañana... At 10.33 this morning, the humanitarian aid was officially handed over to Juan Guaidó, the interim president of Venezuela. At this moment, he's in Colombia giving a press conference, together with the presidents of Paraguay and Colombia, and the secretary general of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro. They're calling on the Venezuelan military to stop the violence and allow humanitarian aid into the country. Para que cese la violencia y permitan el ingreso de la ayuda humanitaria. By letting the aid in, the military would be sending a clear message that it recognizes Guaido as interim leader. By stopping the supplies at the border, it would show it remains loyal to Maduro. So there's far more at stake here than just aid. It's about the power of images and a showdown between two men who both claim to be Venezuela's legitimate president. We've come as far as we can go on the bridge. We can't go any further because the Colombian police have cordoned it off. At the end of the bridge, the containers and the tanker truck are blocking the entrance to the bridge. On the truck, we can see a camera person and a journalist who are looking over at our side. They must be waiting to see if something happens on this side of the Colombian-Venezuelan border. On the Colombian side of the Las Tienditas International Bridge, all the cameras are pointed toward Venezuela. But nothing happens. Several hours pass, and still nothing happens. This is what the entrance to the Tienditas Bridge in Cúcuta looks like. We can see the trucks carrying the humanitarian aid and the people who... Where are these trucks going? To Ureña? These trucks are now going to Ureña. Urania lies on the Venezuelan side of the Santander Bridge, and it's over this bridge that the aid convoy wants to try to cross the border. But moments later, one of the trucks goes up in flames. On the Santander Bridge, an altercation erupts between demonstrators and Venezuelan security forces. After they crossed the borderline here, between Venezuela and Colombia, on the Santander Bridge, the tear gas attacks began. 
y, por, y, eh, y eso tuvo como reacción que hubiese una respuesta. And now you can see lots of men throwing stones toward the Venezuelan side. Que están lanzando piedra a la comisión. A tear gas cartridge went off right next to the journalists. It had just been fired. Hopefully no one was hit. It was tossed into the river right away, but the smell's still quite strong. They're throwing Molotov cocktails. Careful, they could set fire to the truck. No one here knows which side set the truck on fire, or whether they did it on purpose or by accident. We can see that a truck is going up in flames, the first truck that tried to cross the bridge. The people fighting here say it was the Venezuelan police who set the truck on fire. A propaganda war rages in the media and social networks. Some blame Maduro's security forces and call for a military intervention. In their eyes, the burning truck is a symbol of Maduro's flagrant violation of human rights. Others believe Maduro's opponents set the fire to discredit him, but maybe it was simply an accident. Some of the relief supplies on board can be salvaged. But on this day, not a single aid package makes it across the border from Colombia to Venezuela. Many people's hopes have been dashed that the military would switch sides. Meanwhile in Caracas, President Maduro announces that he is severing diplomatic relations with Colombia and closing the borders between the two countries. The border between Venezuela and Colombia has now been closed for two days, but people are still crossing back and forth using what's known as trochas, illegal trails that lead right through the river. It's a dangerous route as the trochas are controlled by criminal gangs. Anyone who wants to cross over here must pay. The police and military on both sides of the border simply look the other way. Young Venezuelan refugees have gathered under the border bridge. Some are still children. They call themselves La Resistencia, the resistance to the Maduro regime. We didn't get through. They just smirked at us. But he who laughs last, laughs best. And who will that be? From what I've read, it looks like a military intervention is off the table. And no one knows if Guaido will return to Venezuela today. So the game's still wide open. Right now, we're reporting from the Simon Bolivar Bridge, where the Venezuelan National Guard has advanced almost to the Colombian border.
the young people vent their frustration at the Venezuelan police on the other side of the bridge, pelting them with stones and sticks. People are injured. In Cucuras La Parada district, right behind the border bridge, the situation has remained calm. Many Venezuelan refugees now live here, some of the one million who've sought shelter in Colombia. Okay. When I came here, the people in this house helped me, and for that I'm grateful. The folks here are like my family. I sold candies here, lollipops, cakes. Some days I didn't sell a thing and couldn't pay my rent or went to bed hungry. But I didn't complain. I didn't want to burden anyone. I come from an agricultural zone, the Tucotonema Valley in the state of Aragua. It was once a very productive area with lots of small farms. I'm a small farmer from there myself. Unfortunately, I had to leave because we had nothing. No seeds, no fertilizer, nothing. Instead, we were dispossessed and lost the little we had left. Since the farm supply business Acropatria was nationalized, agriculture in the entire area has ground to a halt. Mr. President, use your common sense. Look at our state and acknowledge the problems you've created. Because you're to blame for what we're going through. What do you think about what's happening now? You can't find cornmeal in the supermarket, but you can find it on the black market. There it costs two or three times as much. Is that corruption? That is corruption, because who supplies the black market vendor? Someone has to get him the goods that he sells. And does that affect you? Me and all Venezuelans. Wilmer Aswahe was once a political ally of Hugo Chavez, but in 2008 began to investigate corruption within the Chavez family. Since then, he's been arrested twice and tortured by the secret police. According to the information we have, I'll tell you, across the board, even the biggest idiot has a hundred million dollars. Why is the country in the state it is? Because of the corruption. It's not the sanctions. It's not Donald Trump or Ivan Duque. No, it's because they've stolen everything. In the state of Barinas, they have their stooges who hide the money of the ministers. Well, ex-ministers to us. We're the government now. And the day will come when there will be justice in Venezuela and many truths will be uncovered that we still know nothing about. Corruption is one of the root causes of the Venezuelan crisis and of the country's frequent power outages. Cesar has uncovered cases of corruption in the nationalized energy sector. Take electricity. Let me give you an example. First, you let the power grid grow old and decrepit. Second, you declare an electricity crisis. Third, the crisis lets you award contracts without having to call for tenders. Fourth, this gives you the chance to hand out contracts to your friends. Fifth, with your friends' help, you can inflate prices. Sixth, you can also buy junk instead of new equipment. Seventh, as a result, people die because the power goes off in hospitals. Why did you leave? Why did you flee Venezuela? Y 
y por pues, denuncia eh, hicieron pues, todo el robo que se estaba haciendo en la división contra fuera de Pereza. The crisis has also increased tensions with the world's major powers. The U.S., Russia and China are pursuing their own interests. It's about geopolitics and oil. The first scenario is that Maduro stays in power and rules over a land in ruins. The second scenario is that there's a transition initiated by the Venezuelans themselves, but that will result in deaths. So a coup executed by the military, but with a transitional government in which civil authorities would also take part. Should there be a coup, then such a scenario would be the most successful one. A scenario in which power doesn't all wind up with the military, but with a government composed of the military and civilians. What civil authorities that would be, we don't know yet. And the third scenario, which I see as being the most likely one, is a transition that's the result of an international military intervention. Venezuela's fate no longer lies in the hands of Venezuelans alone. The outcome of this power struggle is still wide open. I've always said I want to perform my job as a journalist from the opposite side of the street. That's where we always need to be, but with another government. It's my duty to confront those in power, to raise a critical voice, regardless of which government is in power. Cesar Batiz is back in Venezuela, but the story doesn't end here. Juan Guaido has also returned. The government and the opposition are calling on their supporters to take to the streets. A week after Cesar's return, Venezuela suffered a massive near-total blackout that lasted five days. It left 20 million people without drinking water or electricity and led to the deaths of dozens of patients in darkened hospitals. <laughs> 